Well, let's go ahead and get into the Word this morning. We are continuing our unplanned series, but powerful series nonetheless. This means war. The enemy, Lucifer, Satan, when he, before you became to Christ, you just started to follow Christ, he, he sure wasn't for you, but he definitely needed, didn't need to attack you like he does now. Because when you became a follower of Jesus, when you decided to give your life to him, things had the power to change in your life and in the lives of other people around you. And so he gets a little scared about what it is and his influence in this world when there are believers being raised up. And so he makes a declaration of war upon our lives every time there is somebody that gives their heart to Jesus. He will throw whatever he can at you in this war called spiritual warfare. He will throw all he can at you to defeat you. He will throw all he can at you to discourage you. He will throw all he can at you to discredit you. He will throw all he can at you to destroy you. Why? Not because he hates you, but he hates God. Oh, he hates our heavenly father. And likewise, because you are created and especially created anew by our heavenly father, that means he also hates you. He hates the purpose that you have. In fact, his one purpose is to defeat your purpose. The Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 10, that he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what Jesus said about it. Oh, but thank God for his love and his grace and his mercy towards us because he makes sure that we have exactly what we need to fight off the attack of the enemy in our lives. In fact, in Ephesians chapter six, there is a listing in Paul's church or a letter to the church of Ephesus. And as he's concluding his letter, he talks about what's called the armor of God. And he starts to list off all these different attributes and these articles that we are able to wear as we wage spiritual warfare against the enemy. Because we need to be equipped well. And we need to be able to stand firm. And we need to be able to hold on tightly to the faith that we profess. And so God in his infinite wisdom and understanding and empathy for his creation, he gives us the tools we need. We're going to read this passage of Scripture every week for the next six or seven weeks, so you're going to get sick of it, but you'll also know it, I promise. Look at with me Ephesians chapter 6. Let's start in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, then stand firm. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This morning, I want to talk to you about the truth about the attack. The truth about the attack. Let's pray for the word this morning. Father, thank you so much for your word the word that brings life, the word that brings change. Lord, you gave me a sermon that I wrote down. Now, Lord, I pray that you help speak a message to your people. Lord, let us receive what it is you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before we get into the specific armor that we're going to talk about today, the specific article, let's look at the armor as a whole for just a couple of moments. In this letter, to the church of Ephesus, Paul said to put on the full armor of God in verse 11. The key thing here to realize is whose armor I'm putting on. It's not my armor. 
And it's not someone else's armor. It's God's armor. And God's armor, it fits my life perfectly. I'm reminded when I say that phrase of the time when David, right before he goes to battle Goliath and King Saul, he gives him his armor and David puts it on and he says, you know what? It feels a little weird. It doesn't exactly move with me the way I would think it should move with me. I feel like I'm hindered more than I'm not. And so he feels he's better off without it than he is with it. That is not the way the armor of God works in our life. David learned something valuable. He learned that something that was intended for someone else does him no good. But God's armor, though it is his armor, it is suited for every declared circumstance, every trial, every attack of the enemy upon my life. I need his armor in my life. It will help me take my stand against the enemy's schemes in my life. All of this armor, save one piece, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the text says, is a defensive article. It is not meant for me to go on the offensive and to take ground or to advance my ground against the enemy. The armor of God is meant to help me hold my ground, to stand the ground that I have gained because of Christ. That's exactly what he says in verse 13. He says, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Say that with me, stand my ground. I'm supposed to stand my ground in victory from sinful addiction. They have been broken in my life. I'm supposed to stand my ground free of those. I'm supposed to stand my ground from uh, emotional bondage. Living free of fear, anxiety, stress, and depression. I'm not supposed to move back into those. I'm supposed to stand my ground in those. I'm supposed to stand my ground away from the toxic relationships that I have been set free from because I now follow Christ and embrace the life-giving, beneficial relationships that I have now because I follow Christ. And knowing that standing our ground would be crucial to our life when under spiritual warfare, Paul found this meaningful and relevant way to convey not just the importance of, but also the practicality of how we can fight and stand our ground in this fight. Ephesians is what's called a prison epistle, meaning it was written while he was in prison. He is under guard in Rome, most likely, as he writes the letter to the church in Ephesus. And he's chained to this man that is guarding him. And I just imagine him in his cell or where he was being held at the time. And he's coming and he has these thoughts in his mind about how the enemy attacks. And it's, it seems like it's against my, my fellow man. It seems like it's against my family. It seems like it's against my friends, but it's not really against flesh and blood. And he has this thought in his mind that it's against the rulers and the principalities and the authorities of this dark world. And he wants to convey something of how to stand up against it. And he looks over and he sees the guy that's guarding him and it just snaps in his head. It just clicks. The armor of God. He sees this man just sitting there and he's wearing this armor and it's just so simple. It's just so relatable to what it is that he wants to convey. It's pertinent to not just Paul's circumstance as he's in prison. It's pertinent to even his readers because his readers in Ephesus and in the general area, they're under Roman occupation. It is nothing new to see Roman guards in full armor walking in the street. And so as he writes, our struggle, it's not against flesh and blood, but it's against this and the rulers of this dark age and against Satan. He says, put on the full armor of God and fight this battle because this is how you need to be protected. God's armor on someone else will not protect me. God's armor can't be put on for me. I am the one that has to actively and intentionally put this armor on. And as he goes through each and every piece and each and every article, a lot of them, they kind of seem self-explanatory. The breastplate of righteousness. I mean, it kind of seems that way. We'll get more into that later. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. They they feel like they kind of speak for themselves, but there's two of them that have always kind of seemed abstract in nature to me. 
And maybe they've seemed that way to you. One of them it was the one right there in the middle. The shoes fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. It just always seemed a little abstract to me. And then the one that we're going to talk about for the remainder of this morning, the belt of truth. The one that starts off his list. The questions I've always kind of asked myself, the belt of truth, what does this even mean? And why is truth described as a belt? And even as I read the passage this morning, I was kind of thinking it feels out of place in its placement because I don't know about you, but when I'm getting ready in the morning, I put on my belt last. Maybe I'm just weird. Now that's beside the point. Okay, I I put on my belt last, all right? That's the way I do it. Paul, he mentions it first. When Paul refers to the belt of truth, he's most likely referring to this leather apron that you see on the screen there. It would be tied on first. And this leather apron, it has multiple purposes. It it secures the clothing that's worn underneath of the armor because experience told the Romans that if they didn't have something securing the tunics on underneath, that they would get in the way in the battle. And so it secures what it is that's on underneath them so that it does not get in the way. And then also it has this apron, these these long leather pieces that hang down and they're coated in brass pieces that would protect the soldier's groin area and lower abdomen. And it provided protection to some of the most vulnerable area of the soldier's body. Likewise, the belt of truth in my life, it has multiple purposes. Truth is the foundational element that holds it all together. It holds everything else because certain things start to ride up in my life that if I don't have the belt of truth on, uh, the enemy, he'll come and he'll start to get me to question and he'll start to get me to, to ask silly things about my faith and about my walk. And if I don't have the belt of truth firmly in place with what God truly says about my walk, things will ride up in my life but it's also a motivational element that keeps me pressing on towards the goal and keeps me protected while I advance forward in my walk. It protects the most vulnerable areas of my life, truth. The truth that I am a sinner. The truth that says that I need Jesus in my life to be able to confront the problem of sin in my life. And the belt of truth, we initially put it on when we accept Jesus, but it is something that we need to continually put on because truth is where the enemy is going to attack us the hardest. If there is going to be an area of attack that he's going to make, it is going to be in the area of truth because if he can get you to deny truth, he will destroy your life. His latest attacks in this world are the same as his first attack upon this world. It's centered around truth. For the remainder of this morning, we're going to look at his first attack on this world, the first spiritual battle fought. We're going to take a look at what happened in the Garden of Eden and how the enemy got Adam and Eve to deny truth. And we are going to see how he distorted truth then, and how he still is doing the same thing now, distorting truth in our lives. Let's take a look this morning. First of all, the enemy distorts the truth of God's good intentions. God has good intentions for you. Look what he told Adam, God told Adam in Genesis chapter two. This is God speaking. He says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Two aspects of truth we see here, right in these small verses. The truth of what Adam and Eve were free to do. They're free to eat from any tree save one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then there's the truth of consequence, that if they were to disobey and they were to eat from that tree, then they would die. They would perish. Now, the Bible, it doesn't go into detail about how much time passed between chapter 2 and these verses and chapter 3. But at some point, the enemy came seeking to attack truth. 
In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? And then if you skip down to verse 4, he attacks the next aspect. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. The enemy spoke to Eve, attacking with just a small seed of doubt. Did God really say? Did God really say this? Sure, the accusation is absurd. Oh, it's absurd. Oh, did God really say not to eat from any tree? And Eve, she, she confronts the absurdity of that statement right off the bat. No, that's not what he said. He said we have freedom to eat from every tree. There's just one that he's trying to keep us from. But that initial interaction opened a door. Satan now had the ability to directly contradict not just the absurdity of all truth, but the absurdity or, or the, the, the fine minutia of every truth. Because there was an element of, to truth in his words when he said, you will not certainly die because once that bite was taken, they did not drop down dead. They didn't die, but that's not the point. All the enemy is concerned with is distorting uh, just uh, ever so slightly the element of truth in your life. That God's good intentions for us, that it is absurd to think that he has good things for you. Because he, in the moment, he'll start to say things, and in the moment, it, it might seem like it's true. It might seem like that. that's exactly what, what God is. God is against me. But it's not that way. And if he can open up our minds to just the smallest aspect of denying the truth of who God is, he will make us fall. He is still doing the exact same thing today in this day and age. He's still masquerading around with genuine concerns of God's intentions. How can he show us that he is better concerned for us than our loving Heavenly Father? When the belt of truth is fashioned around and fastened around our waist, we'll see that the only goal of the enemy's attack is to defeat truth in your life. Oh, he'll start to ask things. He'll start to ask things like, oh, did God really say? Oh, did God really say, love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? Do you know how much effort that does that God can't truly mean all of that? Oh, did God really say, love your neighbor as yourself? Have you seen your neighbor? Surely God didn't say that about your neighbors. Oh, did God really say, be holy as I am holy? Did God really say, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age? Does it feel like he's with you right now? Does it really seem like God is holding out for you, that God has your back? Did God really say that? Did God really say to pick up your cross daily and to follow him? We lose the war when we deny the truth that yes, God really did say these things. And because I am wearing the belt of truth, I'm able to respond in confidence and authority, not necessarily at, at the enemy, but more so even to myself, that I need to respond and tell myself that I might not know all the reasons why he has put his, his, his his obligations upon my life, his commands upon my life, but I know and I trust what his word says, that he loves me that he cherishes me, that he has good intentions for me, that his plan and his purpose for me, it is all drawn out and it is something that is he is intentional about in my life. He has good intentions for me. Oh, he has good intentions. He has good intentions to provide for me. Philippians chapter four, verse 19, Paul, he says, God meets all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. He has good intentions to help me to prosper. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse seven, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. He has good intentions to protect his cherished possession. Second Thessalonians verse, uh, chapter three, verse three, he says, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you 
from the evil one. When he comes into your life, did God really say, absolutely, he said that because it's protecting me. God intends for me to live in peace in tumultuous times. Uh, Philippians chapter four, verse nine, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice in the God of peace. He will be with you. Oh, in spiritual warfare, the enemy, he wants me to see God's commands as nothing more than him holding his best from me. But that is nothing but a deception. It's meant for me to live in the burden of second-guessing God's motives, his loving nature to second-guess his best intentions for me. That brings us to our second aspect. The enemy distorts the truth of God's infallible standards. The serpent, he says to Eve in Genesis 3, verse 5, for God knows that when you eat from it, being the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. The enemy, he paints a picture here with a couple different meanings. He paints a picture to Eve that is meant to corrupt God's standards in her eyes and in the eyes of Adam. And he's painting this picture of that God's motives. They're not pure. The serpent wanted them to believe that God's motives, that they were imperfect and they were untrustworthy, that they were fallible, that they were able to be in error, and that all God was concerned with was losing his status to be held by his creation. And so he makes God look insecure. He makes God look in the eyes of Adam and Eve like, and he tells them, oh, God knows that when you eat from it, he's in essence saying that God fears their potential. He's in essence telling them that God fears losing his position of all powerful and supreme in their life. He's trying to tell them that God fears that being challenged by his own creation. And that all of those fears that God has are just a single bite away. And then the other thing that he's trying to convey to them is that they themselves, though created beings, that they have the potential to become greater than God himself. He tells them, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And that this here, it is an opportunity to move past what you're created to be. That this is an opportunity to be like God yourself. Because the enemy, he's using the exact same tactics today. He hasn't changed any of his MO. It is the exact same things. He wants to discredit the truth of why God says to do what he says to do. He whispers to whoever will listen, God's standards for your life, they're a sign of his self-doubt about his own existence. That he fears you and what you mean to his reign that he's holding back from you what you really need in your life because he's afraid of what it is you'll grow into. And he whispers to whomever will listen who God made you to be. It can be defined by what it is that you think about yourself. It can be defined by what it is that you feel about yourself. It can be defined by what it is you believe about yourself. And he wants you to believe that truth in your life It is relative and it is fluid, that it can be changed by any given moment, any given circumstance, any given season that you come across, that you have the power to change truth in your life. The belt of truth this morning, it is not relative, it is not fluid, it is absolute. His truth is pure and it has complete authority in my life. His standards for my life, they are just simply to make him greater in my life. He wants to be greater in my life. He wants to be growing in my life. He wants to be at a higher level tomorrow in my life than what he is right now in my life. And his standards ensures that he continually is being made greater in my life. His standards validate the absolute truth. that I am absolutely a sinner. His standards validate the truth that I am absolutely in need of Jesus as my Savior. 
They absolutely validate that there is but one God. They absolutely validate that he does not change and that there is a standard that he desires me to live by. Not mine, not whatever it is that I feel tomorrow or next day or next week or next year, but by his standard. When I wear the belt of truth, I'll see his standards, that they are what they truly are, that they are protection for me and in my life, that he's protecting me from this enemy that's helping me to move beyond from selfishness, that he's protecting me from the enemy, that he's helping me move beyond conceit and vanity, that he's helping me and he's helping me move beyond between my sinful and carnal nature. His standards, they protect me from the enemy who has never done anything but lie to me, who has never done anything but seek to steal, to kill, and to destroy me, who has never done anything but to roam around like a roaming lion looking to devour me. And the belt of truth shows me that anything less than absolute truth is absolute bondage. Bondage to myself, bondage to my opinion, bondage to my feelings. Bondage to fear, bondage to uncertainty, bondage to hopelessness, bondage to the enemy. And when the enemy keeps me from putting on the belt of truth this morning, he'll keep me from seeing one final thing. And that's our last aspect this morning is that the enemy, he distorts the truth that he is insidious. The enemy is insidious this morning. The culmination of all the serpents sneaking around and conniving conversations. You can see them in Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 6. It says that the woman, when she saw the fruit of the tree, was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together, making a covering for themselves. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to him, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I for Adam and Eve what the enemy started off to say it started off making sense and so they listened in the moment they took the first bite they experienced something that they never thought would happen the covering of God's presence covering of God's presence that had kept them from shame covering of his presence that kept them from peace The covering of God's presence that kept them fulfilled and satisfied. That presence was now frightening to them. Adam and Eve didn't just deny God's command. They deny God himself. When the conversation started off, it was was innocent. It was innocent. That's the way the enemy works. He's insidious. He starts off just with this, random question and it seems innocent at the time but he's still trying to remove truth from your life he's asking questions that seemed beneficial and it might not be as blatant as did god really say he's using more sophisticated tactics now he's using big words like deconstructing our faith he's talking about things about asking yourself why do you believe what you believe He's asking us to to get into the word and look for contradictions between the word and the way God's people apply the word. And you know, at at times I suppose that there's, there's, there's an element of health to that, to know why it is that we believe what we believe and to be able to separate ourselves from improper practices within the church. But when the answers to these questions make our faith stronger, you can know it's something beneficial in your life. But when the answer to those questions, they take you farther away from God, They take you farther away from his standards. They take you out of his good intentions for your life. You will know the truth that he has denied truth, that he has distorted truth in your life. We need the belt of truth in our life. 
so that we will see the enemy for who he truly is. He is insidious and insincere. If I don't wear it, he'll speak. And because I, he's crafty with his words, and he's conniving with his words, what he says could seem beneficial and helpful. But his words always take me away from God. And that's the problem with even listening to the enemy. He's so deceptive. Before you even realize what's going on, it's too late. Oh, Adam and Eve, they sure could have used the belt of truth. Had they had it on, they would have seen the serpent for what he truly is, a deadly, sneaking, conniving snake. A snake that would do all that he can to get at them and who's doing all that he can to get at you to get you to deny the ultimate truth. That truth is not just a fact, it's not just a belief, it's not just an idea. But I want to close this morning talking about how truth is an identity. Truth is an identity. Truth is not solely what God says. Truth is who God is. It's who he is. God doesn't only just define truth in our lives. God just doesn't speak truth over our lives. God is truth for our lives. And the enemy, he wants you so much more than just to abandon God's commands and to destroy his commands in your life. He wants to destroy every interaction you can have with the Father. He succeeded with Adam and Eve as they hid from the presence of God. And if he can destroy truth in your life, he'll destroy that interaction that you are able to have with truth himself. When we sin, we're not rejecting a rule or a principle or some sort of abstract law that God has put just out there. We are rejecting him and denying him himself. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. It is his identity this morning. And when you put on the belt of truth, you're putting on his identity in your life. You're identifying with his good intentions for your life. You're identifying with his standards for your life. And it's so much more. You're identifying with his encouragement upon your life. You're identifying with his challenge and the way he drives you. You're identifying with his leading you. You're identifying with his helping you this morning. The truth about the attack this morning. The enemy destroys the truth of God's good intentions. The enemy destroys the truth of God's infallible standards. The enemy destroys the truth of what he truly is. He is insidious. But most importantly today, the enemy is looking to destroy the truth of who truth is in your life. Jesus said that the key to freedom is knowing truth. He says when you know truth, truth will set you free. It's freedom the belt of truth. You, you would think that something that you would wrap around you and tie up something about you, that, that would be bondage. But no, it is freedom. When you wear truth, when you know truth, when you live truth, it is freedom. Every head bowed, every eye closed in this place today.